Odyssey Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And after this past synod, things are continually getting messier and messier in the Christian Reformed Church. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We are dropping episodes every single Sunday evening. We also want to continue to say thanks to everyone who sponsored us on Patreon. We're slowly making our way toward our goal of 20 sponsors at $5 a month. If you appreciate what we're doing and want to help us continue to put out content, head on over to patreon.com slash the messy reformation. You can also support us for free by sharing our content. I'm a terrible self marketer and need your help. If you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to this content, let them know about the messy reformation. Also, let them know about our newest announcement, the Hall of Tyrannus. We're really excited about this new opportunity to disciple reformers for the CRCNA. If you'd like more information on this, head on over to themessyreformation.com and look for the Hall of Tyrannus. With all of that said, we're going to get to this week's episode, which is part one of our conversation with Lee Christoffels. So, Lee, why don't you kick us off and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and the church that you're at? Okay. Um, well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Worthington Christian Reformed Church. I've been a minister for 52 years. I was ordained in 1970 and uh, have loved being a minister all the way through, even though there they're, uh, obviously are and were, um, you know, some stressful times um i'm not going to pretend that wasn't there um but it's been overall um wonderful to have the privilege of preaching god's word and i love to preach and um uh and that's what i'm doing now i am retired and have been for uh, 12 years i can't believe that many years went by um but i was i was the pastor of worthington crc for uh 12 years um and then retired and since that time, I've had a number of, well, mostly I, I preach in, in various churches, but I have a part-time assistant. Um, I'm a part-time assistant at First CRC in Edgerton. So I preach there twice a month, and I visit um, during the week, not necessarily every week, but I have a bunch of visits I do for them and love doing that. And, um, uh, and then whenever I'm not preaching there, I am usually in somebody else's pulpit, uh, both morning and evening. My wife comes along with me, and uh, so we uh, we enjoy driving to all these different churches and getting to know all the people that are from all over the place. So my wife and I have been married 54 years, and uh, we have five kids and 20 grandkids. And um, typically the grandkids, they're all home at Christmas time. It's a little chaotic. Uh, we have 20 of them sleeping on the floor. Well, not all on the same floor, um, but um, we kind of get worn out by it, but we think it's great, but things are changing as they get older. So uh, that might not be happening all the time uh, from now on. So yeah. the, the city of Worthington is built around a lake. It's a beautiful lake, Okabina, and uh, it's a um, community with a lot of newcomers. Um, I had a um, a supper. So we were at a soup supper recently for, for our Christian school and met a public school teacher there who teaches um, ESL in uh, the high school here. And he told me there are at least 30 languages spoken as the native language wow. in Worthington. And there are um, uh, all kinds of people arriving weekly from Central America. And he has them in his class. They work at night these are high school kids or maybe 17, 18, 19 year old kids. They work all night and then they go to school during the day because they have to pay expenses. They're single, they're by themselves. 
and uh, so it's quite uh, quite a, a, ch a challenge. So our congregation here has, in the past, had worship services in four languages, including wow. English, um, of course, but Anuak and uh, is a Sudanese language. Oromo is a an Ethiopian language, and of course, Laos is from La Laotian is from Laos. So we had services in those languages because they were more comfortable for the people in their own native language. We don't have that at now, uh, except there is an Aromo service or a, an Anyuak service some of the time. Um, but um, some of them are coming to the regular English service as they learn English and others have moved away. And, you know, so there's a, a constant change of, uh, of that. Well, praise God. That's a, that's a beautiful ministry. Have I didn't know all of that about Worthington. I didn't know there was that much uh, immigration there. And oh, there's uh, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, praise God for for yeah the way He's using uh, your church and 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 you in in the midst of all of that. Yeah, it's um, been it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear. So um, I was trying to remember. You said you were ordained in what year? Nineteen seventy. 1970. Okay. Yeah, so he, I know that it, sounds ancient to you, but <laughs> no, well, I I'd, I'd just love to hear like, what have been some of the joys of ministry um, that you've had over, you know, those 52 years, what were some of the high, high points of, of ministry? Um, well, for one thing, the main thing that a minister does is preach. And I, I do love preaching. Um, it's constantly challenging too. But um, I think that um, uh, what I have enjoyed seeing is people coming to know the Bible and to understand what the Reformed faith is and uh, maybe come up to me years later and say, I remember that. Or, you know, we, we talked about this long ago and and uh, I just had the uh, the privilege yesterday of, of uh, preaching in a church where um the elder that led in the congregational prayer had been one of my seventh graders years and years ago. Uh, and he's now retired. <laughs> he's Praise a God. professor at Dort, but he uh, retired. And, uh, and then, so I mentioned that he had been one of my kids and then he said, well, since he said that, I'll say that, you know, he s spoke about remembering the ministry that we had had there. So some of those things are really um, a joy and seeing people come to know, and understand the Christian faith and what it means for living a godly life. Um, those are really tremendous things. And sometimes there are specific things that you see in people's lives. Um, one of the fun things I think has been um, working with uh, young people and then seeing them grow up. Uh, they make profession of faith when I'm their pastor, then they get married and um, then they, I might get to baptize their first baby. Um, if you stay a while in a church, I really think it's good to stay 25 or 30 years in a church, but I've only done 11 and 12 is the longest. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would do that differently in some ways, although, you know, I can't say I did the wrong thing or that I didn't follow God's call. I, I think I was, but uh, mm -hmm. still, I think there's a great benefit in a long ministry yeah. in one place. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I'm I'm still a young buck, so. Uh, yeah. But I I was you know I was a youth pastor um at in one location for eleven years, which was mm. like really really long for a youth pastor. Right, it is back in the day. So, um, and I I've done a lot. I, I've told people I've I've spent a lot of time listening to guys like uh, John Piper, who spent thirty three years in one church, and yeah. and Alistair Begg, I think, is going on almost forty years now. I think in in his church. And uh, they have a lot of wisdom, I think, for us and how, what it takes to stay in a church for a long yeah. time and, and just the massive kind of benefit of being there. And, and if we believe, I've been talking to a lot of people about this lately, like uh, Jesus has this idea, well, it's not, it's not just idea, he describes the kingdom as being leavened, that kind of leavens the dough. And yeah. uh, I think that's kind of just ministry in general is this leavening of a congregation and and families and and that takes a long time for to work you can't just come in and fix a church in five years or whatever you right just it's kind of a long obedience in the same direction right that's right um, yeah and uh, i think and that, that it was um kind of uh, there was kind of an assumption when i began the ministry that there might be a few people who stay a long time but uh, mostly you just kind of move around from one place to the other 
Um, and uh, I don't think that that's very healthy for the congregation or the minister. When you stay a while, you're forced to preach on different things that you might not have covered otherwise. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, I, I guess there, there was a preacher in, in Dallas, Texas that I heard of. I think his name was Criswell in a Baptist church. And um, people would say, well, I was saved in Second Chronicles 3. Uh, or I was saved in Ezekiel 4. Uh, well, because he went right straight through the Bible from the beginning to the end. Um, hmm. And, uh, uh, well, I don't know that we're all cut from that same claw. Some of us just don't have the staying power, and then we need to know that that's not going to work. Yeah. But um, there is a, I do think there is a great advantage in staying and seeing through um, people's lives and in mold, uh, being us, used by the Lord to mold their lives uh, in a good direction. Yeah. Yeah. And I know one of the things that Alistair Begg has mentioned um, is that one of the benefits of staying in a church for a long time is um, for one, the congregation really gets to realize that the pastor's not perfect and the pastor's not the one who's going to fix the church. Um, but right. also as the pastor, you come to realize that you're not the one who's going to fix Christ's church either. No. And you realize your own flaws and, and you begin to just figure out how to do life and ministry together as well. Yeah which you're, you're stuck with if you live in a community uh, anyway, um, if you're a member versus another member, but the pastor is, is one of them too. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, I would, I would really love to hear, you know, so you've, you know, you've been a pastor now in the CRC since 1970 and, you know, a, a lot of stuff happened in the seventies in the Christian reformed church. Yes. You know, especially things that we've been talking about lately, but even I'm mean, gonna before we even talk about like 1973 human sexuality report, there was there was stuff happening in in you know 1972 around around scripture and all of that. And I'd just love to get your thoughts and kind of perspective on on what the Christian Reformed Church looked like uh, back in the 70s. Like what was happening, what was the field then, and then maybe contrast it to what you're seeing happen mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I think the Christian Reformed Church maybe looked um, more, uh, each church looked more like the other one, uh, at least more then than they do now. Mm -hmm. um, if you, and maybe I'm thinking before that time too, that if you went to a Christian Reformed Church, you pretty much knew what the liturgy was going to be like and how things would go when you were at a worship service there. But um, it started to change a lot in the 70s. I think we were in, uh, affected by the 60s and 70s culture around us, and uh, that started affecting us. So, for example, we had that um, famous report about um, the authority of Scripture and where um, the infallibility of Scripture was questioned seriously, and um, even though synod gave some answers to that. I think not everyone went along with it. And so there was a gradual um, leading or pressure on the church to go in a different direction than, than the historic reformed direction that we had had. And uh, so that began to affect other things as well. And that's partly why I think we got into the big debate about women in office um the the first thing to settle is scripture and its authority and um uh, and i think that became less than clear as time went along um over over those years uh, yeah yeah and then yeah just even talking about the women in office issue i was talking to uh one of our elders who's uh, who's a minister of the word um and has been a minister of the word in the crc mm -hmm. for quite a while and he was talking about, you know, friends of his throughout the whole women in office issue who were deposed because they were called schismatic, right? And uh, and because yeah. they were leaving and all of the depose and all of the tension that was happening back in the nineties. Um, yeah, I, I I wasn't really, you know, I was alive, but I was pretty young and not really paying attention what was going on. But now reading back into all of the tension and stuff that was happening in the nineties. It's uh, it's kind of it's pretty incredible to think about uh, yeah. What some of these major shifts that were happening in the Christian reformed church. Right. And a, a lot of it, of course, it, it, history is always connected from one part to another. And, you know, you can go back to um, 1834 
uh, and the uh, secession in the in the Dutch Church, which um, many of those things got carried on in the Christian Reformed Church, especially our view of con confessional subscription. Um, but I think that has somewhat changed among some people, and that has been an issue, a, a big concern in the in our Christian Reformed denomination. So that um, uh, you don't really know where you are in, in, sometimes in 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 our present time, even though I'm hoping the clarity that the synod found this year um, will have bear will bear fruit in the future. So that the clarity we need in the church will continue. Yeah, well, and that's uh, that's really one of the things that I've been really noticing. Um, leading up to Synod 2022 and coming out of Synod 2022 is I hear different people talking about this is what it means to be reformed. And you think, boy, we're, we're talking about very different things. And, and I've even heard some of the more uh, progressives who were really upset about what happened in Synod 2022 say, well, all those guys are just fundamentalists. They just want to be Baptists. They don't even know what it means to be reformed. And, and I'm thinking, my goodness, I, I look at you, to be completely honest, and I think you don't really know what it means to be reformed in the historic sense. Yeah. And so, like, we, we've really shifted. There's kind of been this divide breaking in the CRC for so long where we have two very different ideas of what it means to be reformed. And, and again, there's one group of us is saying re being reformed is holding to this, holding to our creeds and confessions and, you know, that understanding and there's other this other group of reformed which i don't really quite know why they call themselves reformed if it's this idea of you know always reforming but kind of disconnecting yeah. that from scripture i think that's maybe part of it but um or i i don't know do you do you have any insight on that on on like what where they're at on that i think that um the that whole idea of reforming constantly um has become uh, it was misused, and that saying has affected people, um, to, to, has been allowing them to make excuses for just changing. Um, well, change, if it is repentance and being molded by the Holy Spirit according to Scripture, is great. We, we need to do that constantly. We're not so arrogant that we think we have the last word, although we're not ready to re revise our confessions very quickly. We, we simply won't do that because because of our conviction we believe they we believe in them because they agree with scripture and not in so far as as that was the famous debate in 1834 and that has continued to affect us today um so that i think people are are uh, they think that that reformed is just constantly changing or um yeah whatever is the latest thing and then we're then we're pressured by our our culture and not we're not listening to the pressure of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, um, as He blesses the confessions too, uh, and so we end up um, uh, having this excuse for constantly changing everything. Uh, right. And I don't think we're necessarily against change. Um, may the Lord change my heart daily. That's that's what we need to pray. Um, but uh, and the church to be molded constantly according to what Scripture says. But it's the Scripture that's the testing word. The the, the final. Uh, testing stone <clears throat> so that the ref always reforming is to be reforming according to the word of God, not just whatever we think. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah, no, actually you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I was going to go ahead and uh, just say that the historic use of that word reformed has always had that qualifier. Uh, you are reformed and being reformed according to the word of God. And I think what we're talking about here with this dividing line is that one group wants to be reformed continually according to God's word and how he's spoken and revealed himself. Yep. And the other, by other, what I will just say are worldly artificial means uh, by which they further their own agenda. That's right. That seems to be the dividing line. Would you agree with that? I, I think that's really right. And, and the, the thing that will help us more than anything is our confessional unity. Uh, the three forms of unity uh, need to be uh, remembered that it isn't that they are over scripture, but they guide us in our understanding of scripture. And, and because we have 
agreed to to confess these things and the reason we've done it is we believe that's what's taught in scripture so that will help us and you know i think in the past we have relied on our ethnic um unit ethnic unity and edmund Clowney, former president of westminster seminary and i had him as a as a student um said of the christian reformed church i think i hope i'm not putting words in his mouth he's not around to on this earth anymore to correct me if i'm wrong but i think he said this that the um the christian reformed church is blessed in a way by its ethnic unity but that isn't its real strength the strength is in our confessions and we need to be be certain that it's our faith in Jesus Christ as in as worded in these confessions that is the true unity of the Christian Reformed Church. And uh, and it's only then that we'll be stronger and stronger rather than weaker and weaker. And I think we've seen that as we become more so-called diversified. Um, we want to be one in Christ. And that's what that's our true unity is found in these confessions of faith. That's the it's the free three forms of unity. Um, yeah. And that unifies us. There is this, an old saying that I hear quoted among liberals often, uh, doctrine divides, practice unites, or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's false. Doctrine false. unites. Um, and that's that's why we have a godly practice. Godly practice will only grow out of a unified doctrinal commitment in the church. Yeah. Hundred percent. Well, and that's been the the history of every Reformation, actually. And that's one of the things that that I have found so fascinating is, um, you know, right before right before this past synod, I wrote I wrote an article for Abide, um, asking, you know, who who is actually being divisive here? Is it us, or is it, or yeah. is it the progressives who are being divisive? And and I said, well, they're the ones who are being divisive because we we haven't moved. We've stayed in the same place. They're the ones who, who have moved. Right. And I got so many progressives who wrote me article or wrote responses very angry at me and saying, I can't imagine you would be angry at the Reformation for them being divisive. And I wanted to laugh because I was saying, no, the Reformation kept saying over and over again, they left. We're staying where, with the historic church. That's why they quoted Irenaeus and Augustine, and they were looking back over history saying, this is where the church has always stood, and we're standing there, and the Catholic church actually wandered off the trail and left, but, but people have lost that. And they thought, they think, well, the Reformation was being divisive. They were coming up with this new thing. And so it's okay for us to do that. When the reality is, no, they were saying, this is what the church of the ages has always believed about God's word and salvation. And, and we're trying to reform back to God's original intention right. uh, rather than shape into something new. Yeah, I think we, we need to... Uh understand that the only way to be reformed is to be catholic catholic mm -hmm. with a small c mm -hmm. and um yes um as they say our accent is obvious but why did why why did we ever get to the word reformed it's just because we wanted to clean up and come back to the catholic faith and uh, not the roman faith but the catholic faith and um that's why as you said they they went back to augustine and to um, the the early um, fathers of the church that um, that guide and direct us um, in in so many ways now and there have been thankfully many who go back to the the fountains you know ad fontes as they they said go back to the fountains the beginning and um, and I think that has would help and does help the church and only then does it so it's not just a matter of changing all the time um, yeah. but returning to the real foundations of the church, which is all rooted in scripture. So we have to come back to the Bible. Yeah. And I think just as you were saying that, I think there's probably some of the new, this will probably anger some people, but, but that's okay. Um, some of the new people who are holding on to reform don't actually mean reform. They, they, they use that word thinking more evolve. Yeah. And so we're yeah. talking about reforming into, you know, kind of re being reformed and coming back to God's original intent. And a lot of people think of reform as just evolving. We're, we're evolving into something new in a different culture in a different time. And we're just kind of always changing and developing into something new where we're saying, no, actually our constant 
our constant tendency is prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the one I love. And then yes. we need to be reformed and drawn back to that. Not that we're always kind of in a good place and we just need to re be reformed and or evolve into something different and new. Um, our own hearts, like you already pointed out, our own hearts need to constantly be drawn back to God, drawn back to his word. Every and, day. And our families and our churches and our, I mean, everything needs to keep being pulled back because our tendency is, is to wander away. And actually, I just preached on that yesterday. You know, uh, in John 3, right after John 3, 16, it talks about, you know, this is the judgment. The light came into the world and the world loved the darkness over the light. And uh, and I reminded myself and our congregation that even those of us who are believers, if we're honest, there's something deep down in our heart that's not reformed yet by the word of God. There's something in us that actually hates the light and yes. Christ needs to reform that as well. And, uh, and so our tendency is always to hate the light and to kind of try to run away from the light. And God's word needs to keep guiding us back like a shepherd. That's right. Yeah. And the, this is where uh, we need to keep coming back to Christ, who is that light. Uh, and then we'll have his word. If we trust in Christ, we're going to trust the word he gave us. Uh, and we won't need to keep revising that word even or saying, well, we need a new interpretation of this. Um, or something like that, because I think that quite often people say, well, yeah, I believe in that same word, but I have a different way of reading it than you do. Well, okay, how do we get to that reading? Do we consider all the principles of Reformed exegesis and of interpretation? And um, uh, we need to understand that you don't just do this in a vacuum. Uh, and part of, the, part of the context of it is that holy Catholic church that we're part of. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And would you say, like, would you say that's one of the kind of big issues, uh, concerns facing the church in general today is this understanding of God's word and, and holding that to be authoritative? Or do you see something else being kind of a primary issue? No, I would say that is the primary one. Um, the, the, all of the discussions that we have um, really hinge on our understanding of the authority uh, of scripture and um, and an accurate understanding of it. And yeah, to be sure, we so often need to be corrected in 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 our understanding where we're quite small. And yet, if we see the central theme of scripture controlling everything. So we have the, um, for example, in the catechism, we use the uh, Apostles Creed, the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. Those are foundational for all teaching of children and of adults. And um, uh, if we really believe in the teachings of the Apostles' Creed, we will also believe in the teachings of the Ten Commandments, which are mm -hmm. the final authority for the Christian living and, and godliness. Yes, we're not, we don't do it in order to be saved, but because we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, we aim to keep those commandments and we take them seriously and we and and we we need to do that um overall i think we need to uh keep understanding the the fullness of the biblical message one of the i said that i love preaching and i do and one of the things that i am constantly driven by is the unity of the old and the new testaments um we are not just new testament christians we're biblical christians um, so three-fourths of the Bible is Old Testament, one-fourth is New Testament. So I'm probably overbalanced in one direction, and that is I love preaching on the Old Testament, uh, and, and partly because I see a lack in preaching on the Old Testament because it's foundational for understanding who Christ is. And yeah. Christ himself, um, the thing that moves me is, is especially... Uh, uh, Jesus on the on the road to Emmaus, where it you know it says he did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory, and then it says Jesus, beginning with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, explained all these things that were said concerning him. Well, that's what we need to do. the 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 Old Testament uh, needs to be richly taught to our people, um, and uh, so then they'll they'll be able to sing the Psalms and enjoy yeah. the Psalms and, and actually connect with those Psalms and say, well, that really does express 
um, what's going on in my life. Um, God anticipated that when he gave us the, the, the Psalms. But all of this leads to Christ and the glory of Christ, the light that he brings. Um, there's this beautiful passage, since you mentioned what you preached on yesterday, I'll mention what, uh, mine. I spoke on the last words of David mm -hmm. in 2 Samuel 23, the first seven verses. And um, he speaks about Christ coming like the dawn uh, and like the light of the dawn and like the warmth of the sun uh, when, when you feel it in, in the day and also like the new fallen rain that waters the earth. That's the refreshing, beautiful, glorious Savior that we have. And we get to preach him. But we need to preach him not only according to all the parables and, and things like that in the New Testament, the doctrines that are there, but that the underlying foundation is in the Old Testament. So um, we can't leave that out. Um, and I guess I, I react a little bit to uh, neglecting the Old Testament so um, I had one guy say, well, you're, you always preach an Old Testament text when you come to our church. Um, well, maybe not entirely. I do preach on the New Testament, too, and I love the New Testament. But I, I, I guess I tend to go to the Old often because I, I think it lays the foundation. Mm -hmm. And that's what will help us, I think, through the morass that we're going through with regard to human sexuality or any other question, we, if we have that rich understanding um, when couples get married, I, get, I used to give them, uh, and I still have given, uh, Catherine Voss's Child Story Bible. I grew up on that, and I uh, have given them to newly married couples, thinking they're likely to have children. And even if they don't, this book is for people 8 to 80. And uh, if you have, especially people who don't have much of a background within the church, um, maybe didn't grow up in the church, but are new Christians or new to the Reformed faith, if they know those Bible stories, they have a peg to hang the doctrines on so that they're not just Christians who believe in TULIP, which I do, uh, but uh, there, there's a place to put that. There's a, there's a context in which all these doctrines have developed in the history of salvation, the history of redemption. We, we need to cultivate that among our people. Yeah, amen. And I, I don't remember who it was. I heard a seminary professor somewhere reference Catherine Voss's book, mm. and he said that is the best example of redemptive historical um, storytelling of the it Old is. Testament stories and Christ, everything pointing to Christ. So that is the example for everyone. He said, I, I have all my seminary students read it, he said, because that so... After hearing that, I had to go out and find a copy of it so oh, okay. I could go yeah. through it, and it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, I when I'm preaching through the Old Testament, I'm often pulling out Catherine Voss's stories and reading through it because she does such a phenomenal job of taking the story and then pointing it, pointing it on to Christ, which is amazing. She, they, I heard that she had the advantage when she was preparing that storybook, not only of being married to Gerhardus Voss the great Princeton, well, started at Calvin, but Princeton theologian. Mm -hmm. But she was surrounded by um, other theologians at the time. So they could all help, in a way, give her a context for preparing those Bible stories. And I think they've been tremendously influential and helpful in uh, raising generations of kids. And uh, uh, maybe it needs slight updating here and there, but most, for the most part, uh, I can go with it. It's, yeah. it's really great. It's a it's a whole different level from most of the storybook Bibles being yeah. published today. Like the ones yeah. today yeah. make me cringe and cry a little bit, and I don't hand them out to people because I just think, ah, oh, these are just not good. But but this has got some real meat and heft to it, and I'd love to see yes. it kind of revived again in a new generation. Yep. Yeah, I want to I want to go back, and uh, so one of the things that I was thinking about is we were talking about kind of one of the main issues I think in the church. Um, you know, we talked about how it's this lack of understanding of the authority of God's word. And, and as we were talking about preaching, I, I feel like, and nah, I don't want to, but I'm going to go there. Um, I feel like we've gotten to this place of lack of authority of God's word because of the way God's word has been preached in, in pulpits in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've preached more along the lines of just the authority ends up being in the preacher rather than in God's word or in the stories that they're using or how effective they can tell a story. 
and uh, and then people end up putting their you know they see the pastor as authoritative rather than God's word and so and for me and I think I think you're on the same page with me I, I'm kind of known for being a heavy expositional preacher like emphasizing that because that just puts God's word as the authority kind of the authoritative voice of of what I'm saying. And I just had this um, crazy experience yesterday um, at worship where uh, we had a group of people, um, sh- new people showed up at our church and, and I got to talk with them a little bit and, uh, and then they left and I didn't really get to have a full conversation with them. But uh, one of my elders came up to me afterward and he said, do you know why they came to our church? No, I, I, I didn't ask him that. I was just getting to know them. And he said, they have been looking for solid expositional preaching and they can't find it anywhere. So they drove 40 minutes to our church Wow! because they could find solid expositional preaching here. And I thought, well, yay, I'm glad. Like, I'm glad they, <laughs> yeah. they're doing solid expositional preaching. That's exciting. But the other side of me went, that's really sad that they had to drive that far to it find is. someone who's doing expositional preaching. All they found were people kind of telling story after story after story. That's all we have for this week. Stay tuned next week for part two of our conversation with Lee Christoffels. But until then, don't forget this is Christ Church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season, and keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation.